Welcome to Curtain Call. I'm Kevin Curtin. I'm here today with Doug Snyder, uh, owner and operator of Replay Records, also audio engineer. Uh, today on the show, we're going to be talking about all things vinyl, and I think it's going to be a great show. I think a lot of people are going to, um, you know, get a lot of knowledge from Doug here. And uh, let's get right into it. So, the first thing we're going to talk about today is the history of vinyl. So, Doug, if you can. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Um... Yeah, re recording came into being in the late 1800s, believe it or not. They were trying to find a way to record sound. And although, you know, there's been a lot of refinements, things have basically been the same. We're, t we're in an era where people are appreciating the phonograph record again as a nice method of holding sound, mm -hmm. preserving it, playing it back. Mm -hmm. There's so many different ways you can do that, but let's talk about the, the record. Brief history. Sound is something that is what we're talking about. So just briefly, if people don't think about it much, mm -hmm. sound is vibrations in the air. And I'm not sure I can even understand. But different sounds, like if you hit a drum, you see it vibrate. Mm -hmm. If you play a guitar string, you see that vibration. That's, that moves the air, and it sends out the sound through the air in pot, air compression and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, reduction. So your ear picks up these sounds at, at the frequency generated by the object. Okay. Okay. So basically what a record does is, is recording that in mm -hmm. a form that can be reproduced. The earliest records were done without microphones or electricity, mm -hmm. believe it or not. They actually could sing into a horn mm -hmm. and it would vibrate a membrane that could cut on a, a stylus on a rotating platter. Mm -hmm and the sound, the actual vibrations from the air mm -hmm. were enough to move the membrane and the stylus to cut mm -hmm. the record. Mm -hmm. And they did that up until about 1926 when electrical recording began. Mm -hmm. They started to perfect the microphone at the same time radio and also sound in movies all came about at that mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. in, the, in the technology. You know, mm -hmm. technology built and it's improving, but some of those early acoustically recorded records do sound good for unbelievably well for today. If you played them on a, a machine from that time period, mm -hmm. you used to have those big horns. Yeah. People might remember that. Mm -hmm. When we got to electrical recording, you know, things improved a lot. You had a microphone. You could sing in it mm -hmm. close or you could go back. Mm -hmm. You know, Bing Crosby, a guy who was really popular in the early 20th century, uh, sang close to the mic, and that was new. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. That was the beginning of like pop music recording as opposed to the classical and orchestras and things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we like pop music. Uh, rock and roll came out of pop eventually. Uh, in 1948, well, prior, the earliest records were, were done on what we now call 78s. And right. basically they ran about three minutes long and the earliest ones only had one side. But you would pay three or four dollars for this three or four minutes of music. You needed mm -hmm. to get two sides later. And um, it was of whatever the day. Comedians, opera singers, mm -hmm. things that were loud basically. Because the technology wasn't the best and these were noisy surfaces. Mm -hmm. These were made out of shellac, not mm -hmm. vinyl. So during World War II, after World War II, we, we, the Germans had perfected a magnetic tape. This is important because tape is another medium. We don't use it today, but it's basically what a cassette is. Mm -hmm. It's a form. Um, and studios benefited by that because now they were no longer limited to a three-minute recording. Yeah. So that's why it's important. They could record for 30 minutes mm -hmm. and a long reel of tape. Mm -hmm. Then that tape could be transferred to a record, and many records, and it could be edited, and mm -hmm. lots could be done with it. Right. You know, at first... Uh, People were just recording pretty straightforward, but uh, as the 50s developed, more more studio technology came into play. There were innovators like Les Paul that did overdubbing. Uh, he was the originator of that, as well as fine guitar work. Mm -hmm. And um, especially the rock era in the late 50s, that's when more people started to experiment with sound in the studio, in production. And that brings us up, you know, to the to the LP, which uh, I don't know if you want to um, 
stop me here and no, go, no, correct please, this. Please, no, I mean... <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a, there's a long transition. We had records in the 50s that were only monaural, not stereo. Yeah. The difference between mono and stereo really is simply monaural, mono, single, oral, single sound. Got it. Yeah. Stereophonic, phonic is another sound term. Stereo means two or three dimensional. So we, they were able to finally get two track, two channels in one groove of a record. Um, let me go back to the record again, because. And at what point was mono? You know, at what point did mono come into play? Everything basically was mono originally. Stereo was an afterthought that came in the 1950s. Okay. It was around uh, earlier. There were experiments, but the, the you know tech, the technic technicalities of reproducing it for home use mm -hmm. didn't come to like 1958. Okay. So basically everything was single sound, like the old radios people listened to, they had one big speaker and so were the old record players. Mm -hmm. um, but let me just say that sound was recorded a, on a rotating platter and vibrations were put on it and I guess everybody knows these are called grooves. But it really is one long Groove. You could unwind this; it would be one straight thing. It's just it's, pretty cool, it's just yeah. by rotating and moving across the surface, mm -hmm. you can put more on it. And the ability was was made with the uh, the LPs. The long play was the big innovation. Mm -hmm. Now here's one of an early long play album, and it doesn't look much different than the uh, '78 at all. Right. But the difference is there's four songs on here. Okay. They went to what they call micro groove. Mm -hmm. They got smaller grooves and they slowed the speed down. Right. So consequently, and also at this point, vinyl was mm -hmm. was invented and, and used on records instead mm -hmm. of this harder shellac, which breaks easily. Yeah. So the early pop records looked like this. There wasn't any rock and roll when this stuff came out. Mm -hmm. So so we end up with Liberace. He's good. Nice. He's good. But. Um, Eventually, the 10 inch size led to the 12 inch size. Yeah. And of course, and I what, a great, to the what a great record. You know, I mean. <laughs> so, all pop records. Classic. Be, yeah, mm -hmm. it started to be made 12 inch. That, the size existed in two forms during the 50s. Mm -hmm. and, and a third format was also invented in the late 40s, the, the 45. Um, this again. Is we got three or four minutes worth of time on it, mm -hmm. maybe a little more. You could get eight on an extended play mm -hmm. record. You had basically in 1948, Columbia came out with LPs, mm -hmm. and RCA Victor came out with 45s, mm -hmm. and they thought they both had the future. Yeah, the LP was won out in general because um, a 12-inch LP can get about 30 minutes on a side mm -hmm. if you want it. It's not optimum, but you can do more than 30 minutes. But the 45 still had the limited time length, about four or five to, to seven minutes. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to put an album out, you could put, you know, a 40 minute, 45 minute album all on one disc. If you were doing it on singles, you'd need about five singles to cover it all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. people, over time, the LP, the long play album, the 33 and a third revolution per minute is the format that we basically know today. And the 45 still exists as, as singles. And that was an important part of the market through the 50s and 60s. Yeah. But what happened was there are other ways of storing sound. Now, digital was what happened in the 80s. They've been working on it a long time, but they found a way of taking the sound, hmm. and if I could just explain, if anybody's ever looked at a computer of a sound wave, you see it's ups and downs, okay. vibrations, mm -hmm. which is basically what a record groove is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's vibrations. It's analogous to the way it would look on a computer if you were, hmm. or an oscilloscope, that's how they looked at it in the old days. Um, but the, rec the grooves are so small, they're mm -hmm. micro grooves, so yeah. You can't see them without a microscope. You can't see the details, but you can look at a record mm -hmm. and see some grooves are wider than others and, and heavier than others. The the volume and the frequency of the sound 
matters how the groove, how big the groove will be. Low frequencies are slower but wider and take up more space than high frequencies. Mm -hmm. So a loud rock album with a lot of bass can't be as long as maybe a classical album with a lot of quiet parts. Got it. Okay. So I guess, you know, the, a, a big question that probably a lot of people might want to know um, is, you know, why do people love vinyl so much? I mean, you know, especially now, I mean, because, you know, there's been this huge resurgence in the last few years and, uh, you know, so. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not against, I, I mean, I believe everybody should enjoy the music the way they want. You know, if you, you like CDs, some people still buy them, down, right. people stream or download. You know, whatever you, you like, but a record is a, more of a personal thing because you do own a physical product. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing, and I'll also speak about the technical side in my beliefs. But I think the record album is a part of it. It just has a nice, you know, graphic to it, and you got, uh, you know, everything here. You even had a, an insert on some of these, mm -hmm. not this one. Yeah. Well, okay, so some people, I think, like the process of putting this on, holding it, owning it, yeah. and controlling it. I definitely do, but yeah, and, and I can see that, yeah. I mean, you got two sides. Oh, I don't want to turn the record over and I'm lazy. Well, you know what? That's part of the fun, actually. Yeah. You get that break, you get up in the middle of the record, and yeah. you have to, you know, you can go get a drink and play the mm -hmm. second side later. Right. The CD just runs through, you know, uh, that's okay, too, but... And what's the difference in quality between vinyl and a CD? You know, in simple terms, you know, if people could kind of break it down, you know? Well, there's flaws in everything. Nothing is perfect, but mm. recorded sound, we were talking about that sound wave and the groove being analogous, an analog signal. Uh, digital, what they did is, you, it basically chops up samples on a CD, it's, it's 41,000 times per second, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it shows, if a wave was on, if you visualize a wave going up and down, you're taking a point at each point and assigning a value to it and storing mm -hmm. that, that value in a, com in a chip or a okay. memory. Yeah. And then re restoring it in, back into real time, because mm -hmm. you can't, it's stored in numbers. The ones and zeros. You can't hear it. You have to convert the digital signal back to analog to hear it. Okay. To, to put it through your system, your into your speakers. So basically, at that point, all CDs do is a storage medium, and you have to convert to digital to store mm -hmm. it and convert back. Whereas records can be made in truly analog sound without mm -hmm. that stage. You know, some people say digital degrades the sound somewhat. Um, it has some effect on it, and I don't think it improves the sound. Okay. So I think the record generally has the potential for better sound. But, you know, again, sound is, is subjective, and contrary to what record companies tell you, that this is authentic high fidelity and it's real, real realistic, just like an orchestra in your living room. <laughs> you really can't right. create an orchestra in your living room, but right. you can record really to a good sounding orchestra mm -hmm. over your speakers in your right. room and, and that's suffi sufficient on mm -hmm. a good recording. So we, we were asking me what, why is the analog better? You know, it, it just is closer to the, the essence is. of the sound wave. <laughs> it is what it is. It's, yeah, a, it's, I mean, less, it's two less stages yeah. of, of storage and electronics. Yeah, yeah. Um. You know, and I think a lot of people maybe first getting into, you know, collecting records and whatnot might, might want to know, um, you know, what makes certain records more valuable than others? No, oh, records are made, they're manufactured, they're not, it's, they're, they're more expensive to make than a CD mm -hmm. anyway. So a company would press so many records, you know, after the recording stages, which is a whole thing, I won't even go into it, but when you make records, they may make a thousand, they may make ten thousand, mm -hmm. depending on the artist. They may think a million is adequate. Mm -hmm. You know, in the days of Michael Jackson's Thriller, how many million did he sell? Eleven or nine? Like a hundred million, yeah. Well, so, well worldwide. You know, but yeah. if you yeah. count the CDs and the downloads, right, it, it's right. up there. But yeah. just the vinyl alone sold 
in those days, it's just before the CD era started. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. What was the train of thought? Oh, so we were we were talking about why there why oh, certain what? records are worth more than others, you know? Right. Okay. Yeah. Because of the limited factor of some. Mm. Okay. So. Let's take a Beatles record like Sgt. Pepper's yeah, again. Yeah. This album came out in 1967, and this is an original because it's on this particular label, Capital okay. the Rainbow. Yeah. But in 1969, they pressed it, uh, kept it in print, and they pressed it with a green label. Got it. So, if you want the original one, you need to have this version. You could find it in, in a store, and if you bought it in 69, you would have come with a green label. Okay. And in 1971, they, the Apple label became normal on this record. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, it went back to Capitol Records, and they had an orange label, mm -hmm. they had a purple label, and then they finally went back to this label. But you can tell that, that it's an 80s pressing as opposed to a, a 60s one pretty easily. Yeah. But as collectors, you know, get into this, this just comes with familiarity and knowing what to look for. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, every record probably has a story behind it to a collector because there are sometimes minor differences. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is maybe the most valuable Beatles record, you know, um, for an original pressing? I think, um, you know, probably there's a couple things with the Beatles. There's, there's a rare cover, they call it the Butcher cover. Mm -hmm. A sealed copy of that without the revised cover is worth a lot. They're not, you know, something most people are going to run into. Yeah. Um, of Sgt. Pepper you're talking about? No, no, it was um, the uh, album Yesterday and Today oh, okay. gotcha. from 65, 66, mm -hmm. 66 that came out. Okay. So that album though was just a compilation of Beatles singles and tracks that were left mm -hmm. off of American versions of the albums mm. because Capitol Records figured they could get away with selling them only with 11 songs as opposed to 14 on okay. the British. Yeah. So that's the confusion between the Beatles albums and the Rolling Stones and a lot of 60s British groups mm -hmm. had different albums in America and England. Okay. So now you got two versions to collect if you're a real collector, a British and American. And of course, everywhere else in the world, if you're really a collector. But then also, you had two versions. You had yeah. stereo and mono. Now, getting back to the stereo. Yeah. You know, we lived without stereo recording for a long time, but they developed, you know, a two-speaker sound system and a way to reproduce it in a, in a single groove mm -hmm. by having a, it's a it's two walls of the groove. One moves the left channel, one moves the right, and yeah. your needle follows that. It's mm -hmm. all very small, but it gets amplified to your speakers. Um, but initially, the recordings, the mono still was the norm because back then it was a little bit before FM radio stereo was existent. Things were still played on the radio in mono, and mm -hmm. the 45s were made in mono because they were designed for that, or jukeboxes. Mm -hmm. The single mono out. Um, played on a stereo system comes out through both speakers, so you don't lose anything. But what happens with stereo is you have some sound on one speaker, some sound on the other speaker, and sometimes the illusion of a center channel, mm. if, which is normal, that's how they mix. You can mix in between, you can have a full panorama. Uh, but some of the early stereo records, like the Beatles, in their studio days, they only had a four track tape machine. Right. So they had to record on tape uh, and edit all this down, but they, they'd have to put the band on one track, mm -hmm. basically, and have three tracks left for vocal, lead guitar, and other vocals or hand claps or horns. Yeah. And if they ran out of that, mm -hmm. they'd mix all that down to another tape. Uh, yeah. They'd have two machines and uh, you'd end up with another mono signal of all those things mixed together, but three more tracks to add to. Yeah. Now, when you mix that into stereo, you're left with putting all that stuff either on one speaker or in the middle. You can't re-separate the drums and the bass and the guitar if they mm -hmm. were mixed down. Yeah. That's not to say that all 60s records were made that way. Some were, you know, like, you know, Frank Sinatra might have been recorded with a live orchestra and true yeah. stereo. But that was the brilliance of George Martin, too, who was the producer yeah. of the Beatles. I mean, he was just a phenomenal 
a producer and you know well him and others but definitely yeah. abbey road studios was a norman smith was the beatles engineer not on this album but prior so yeah he later produced pink floyd and the pretty things mm -hmm. and did some singing but the the people doing it just had the technology especially in england but also in america there were some maverick producers that knew how to get sound and then push it past the normal limit like what was acceptable was you know trying to record you know a couple tracks of music and vocals and let you leave it there but mm -hmm. the beatles and george martin knew that they had to go further so right. that that occurred on some songs so you know some beatles songs sound like everything's on one side mm -hmm. and the vocals are on the other side but some other beatles songs sound full it just means they had less reductions in mm -hmm. the in the tracks hmm. I, know, you know, I know that's sort of hard to visualize yeah Maybe i'll bring a diary no, it, it makes sense <laughs> um and I, you know I, it's perfect segue um you know who are some of your favorite producers and engineers you know from that time and maybe up up until now yeah, I think, well, I listened, I, I became more aware of rock music in 1962, I'm, so I'm going to date myself. Um, and I like the Four Seasons, I like that crunchy sound. And yeah, me too. Me so too. around that time, this is before the Beatles were around. Yeah. The Beach Boys came out, mm -hmm. and Del Shannon, the, the guy, everybody knows Phil Spector, who he is. That's mm -hmm. around the time he was starting to come up in the, the business. Um... He was a brilliant producer, but, and he had a touch, and he had a touch that was delicate, and, I mean, some of the sound he got was borrowed from other producers, but he made a statement, kind of, over a few years of some great hits, like Be My Baby, The Do Runner. Sure, sure. He had his own yeah. sound. Other producers were out there, and they sounded different. Some imitated Phil. I mean, he, he was probably the most notable guy in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. In England, there was a guy named Joe Meek, who collectors of that era know very mm -hmm. well. He was almost, let's say he was more insane than Phil Spector. And I'm not trying to put any of these guys down. Joe yeah. Meek is, is gone. Phil Spector, unfortunately, is in jail because right. he played with guns. And right. It's a shame. It's a tragedy. But yeah. I can't yeah. I can't negate the, what he did mm -hmm. and how he touched me, you know. Yeah. So yeah. the songs like He's Sure the Boy I Love and He's a Rebel, by the crystals that's that's sure. where i got into music mm -hmm. and this guy's phil specter's name was everywhere and i i like this stuff so yeah but but then the beatles came out and that changed the whole thing the rolling stones the kinks yeah inspector kind of took a back seat but he ended up producing the mm -hmm. beatles mm -hmm. let it be and uh george harrison and john lennon's first album few albums yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Now, there's George Martin, you mentioned. Yeah. He's a very clean producer, He's but he's brilliant. He's, sure. He's, he's amazing. And he had a lot of stuff before the Beatles mm -hmm. that wasn't rock and roll. I mean, he did classical, he did uh, electronic music, mm -hmm. he did comedy. Uh, you know. Can't forget about Quincy Jones, too, I mean, you know. Yeah, Quincy was a producer. He, he you know, I can tell you, he did a lot of jazz and yeah, he, later yeah. Michael Jackson but yeah. in the 60s jazz he also produced Leslie Gore mm -hmm. who sang It's My Party and um, uh, You Don't Own Me and Quincy produced yeah, them but he, you can tell Quincy obviously focused on the teen market sound of the time mm -hmm. which was a little sappy but maybe he was even a little condescending about it but they sounded good his yeah, record sounded yeah. really good so I like those Leslie Gore records I like those early 60s yeah. stuff I tend to actually like 60s and 70s, and by the 80s, my own personal taste kind of die off because actually all the technology had gotten so good yeah. that everything started to sound the same, basically, really well recorded. But in the early days when you had four tracks, or maybe two or three, eventually eight and 16, people had to experiment more. Mm -hmm. You know, rock and roll was inventing all these sounds all the mm -hmm. time. You know, heavier guitar sounds, bigger drum sounds. You know, it all got, you know, it all was a curve of just great, you know, I don't know how it happened, but there were a lot of good groups out in the 60s. Yeah, and yeah. People like Jimi Hendrix would come along, or the Grateful Dead, and, yeah. you know, these guys were totally unique, but they, mm -hmm. an amalgam of other people's sounds, but they came out new, and and uh, 
the doors, you know. I mean, I'm just thinking of things that still matter that sure. came out, say, in 1967. Yeah. You know, certainly the Beatles. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, we could talk about how other trends in music affected yeah. music. Disco in 75 kind of peaked out and changed it. And then punk yeah. rock came along in yeah. the late yeah. 70s. And the 80s, you know, so what really was happening all this time is the studios were getting more and more equipment. They, they expanded from the 4-track to the 8-track to the 16-track mastering. Right. And from there... 24, 24 right. and right. even 48. So mm -hmm. groups like the Eagles, when they got to the to the studio, yeah. and they all worked along in the 60s, most of them, yeah. Yeah. in earlier incarnations. But now the Eagles had all these tracks, so they could record each instrument separately at a different time. And they had a lot of tracks. And all a the vocals. And they could remix them and redo them, because you could, only, you could record one guitar part at a time. Yeah for one second on that tape and not affect anything else. Yeah. The original people uh, before tape had no opportunity to edit mm -hmm. at all. They yeah. had to play it once through and that was the record. And you know, Bill Simzik who was uh, you know, the Eagles uh, primary uh, engineer during that time, you know, for Hotel California and a couple of their other albums. I mean, he was just Incredible, you know, the way he was able to... That's sounding records, you know. They really are, I mean, you know. Some people, you know, think they're a little too clean, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, yeah. I won't argue with that because they're so successful and, um, you know, I like them enough. You know, but my, my tastes are a little different than that, yeah. generally. But yeah. I got to appreciate it. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. really well recorded. Yeah. They, they were able to... This is one of the things that I didn't know until mm -hmm. later, but you can record a chorus to a song like take it easy and then if that came out good you can edit that chorus four times in the song right. and get away with it because yeah. it just sounds right even though it's the same thing and people have already heard it most people don't notice it mm -hmm. me included yeah i was quite surprised but i picked up on things like that on beatles records now hmm. where they actually that's pretty cool rolling yeah, pretty stones. yeah right. where and now I can take it on my computer and overlay yeah. the two and actually find out it's truly exactly mm. the same track. So, yeah, that's fun. And so, <laughs> you know, from your personal, uh, you know, kind of favorite list, if you, if you might, um, what are some of your favorite records, you know, going back? Uh, you know, it. I loved a lot of stuff in the 60s. There mm -hmm. were groups that, you know, sort of didn't make it like love. But, I, you know, one record I really sticks out as a technical brilliant album that's never been matched was Electric Lady Land by Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. double album I mean he plays all kinds of music on it but some of the mixing on that especially with headphones was was really spectacular and um, he that album was done on 8-track equipment so he he did a lot but it was innovative it was new and, and never really nothing ever sounded like that album mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. so you know, that was with Eddie Kramer and as an engineer, but Jimmy was self-producing on that album. Mm. So he was, a, you know, he learned a lot in a short time. He, he'd been playing guitar a long time, but yeah. when he got to England and started the experience, mm -hmm. started writing songs, you know, he ex exploded. And, but he only made three studio albums in his lifetime. He never really got the last one finished, yeah, uh, yeah. the new Rays of the Rising Sun, mm -hmm. uh, before he passed. So. But then, you you know, you're also a big Kinks fan and Stones. And yeah. All, right? You know, a lot of the Stones and the Kinks old records were only released in mono. Mm -hmm. And uh, record companies in America thought, well, people are buying stereo, so we're going to rechannel them. They, they make this fake stereo out of mono, which is horrible. It's, yeah. I mean, mono is still good. I mean, because it, it, it's full sound in both speakers. I mean, if you think things have to be left and right to sound better, okay. You can say that, and I'll agree that a lot of records do sound better in, in mm -hmm. wide stereo or full stereo. I mean, today it's not an issue because we don't do mono anymore, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless somebody just right. wanted to. Thank Doug again for being on the show. Thank you so much. You're uh, appreciate it. Uh, I think you know we had a great time, and um, I think people are really going to like it. And uh, just want to let everyone know you can follow us on Twitter at curtaincall87 and Instagram curtaincall87. Uh, and you can like us on Facebook. We really appreciate the support. And uh, thank you again, Doug. Thank you. You to make.